Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. If you have your Bibles, turn to uh, Nehemiah chapter 6. We're going to be looking at chapters 6 and 7 today. Uh, not to scare you, that, that probably is close to 100 verses. Uh, so we'll do all that in like a half hour. Uh, but we're actually, we're, basically we're going to walk through chapter 6 and we're going to reference uh, part of chapter 7. Chapter 7 is a lot like chapter 3 with, where it's a whole bunch of, uh, of different names, the genealogy uh, of the returned exile. So you understand that if you've been uh, tracking with us and following along uh, through this series so far. So we're in Nehemiah chapter 6 and 7. Uh, today. So obviously we're, we're in the political season. We're getting closer and closer to uh, election day. And uh, there's all kinds of what we would call, and you hear it all the time, uh, fake news all, all, all around us. We, we, it's a term we, we say. It's, it's something we see. We, we soak in. But it's kind of interesting when you think about it. Like, like fake news isn't, isn't really anything new at all. It's been around since biblical times. You're going to see it in chapter 6 here. Uh, it's been around really for, forever. I don't know if you guys remember. It's probably for those that are maybe a little older in the crowd, more mature. Uh, do you remember kind of being in the supermarket and getting in the checkout line? And they're always like the, the tabloids that were in the checkout lines. Like, like you would see things like this. And that was like, obviously that's fake news. Well, that one might be true. But that, like, fake news. But you can, like, you can click through. Like, like you would see, I remember as a kid, like, just looking at these headlines. And at first, I was like, whoa. But then I realized that's, that's just not, not real stuff. So it was kind of obvious in the beginning. Uh, especially one about uh, bar, see the little title at the bottom there? Bar glasses, glasses help you see straight when you're drunk. So you, you can do all that. Like, it, it's completely fake. But he, here's the reality. That was back then. That's like I, I grew up in the 80s, stuff like that. Like, it's a little more challenging today, isn't it? Because things have gotten better. Technology has changed. Like, like check out some of these. We're going to throw some pictures up there. Well, this is a headline. Uh, you can, obviously, that was fake. But someone actually believed it for a second there at the bottom. So these pictures here, some of these are real and some of these are fake. So we're, we're, I'm just going to let you scroll through. Like, Swifties for Trump. Uh, maybe they are some of those. I, I, I don't know. Uh, some of those pictures there are real. Some are fake. Or some of those could be, wait, flip back one more. Sorry, real quick. Uh, some of those pictures there, um, it, they might be a real picture with a fake picture all intertwined together. You don't know. So I'll let you decide. Uh, the next one, uh, obviously they put that up there. That, that's a fake one. I, I did have one. Uh, and, all right, this is a really good one. Don't be offended. But the dangers of a one-sided story. Listen, you could post that, pop, that top picture and you could think that he's being really a, a jerk to the crowd. But in reality, the bottom picture is what's taking place. And, and that's where you can just manipulate. The media can manipulate you uh, completely. Uh, was there anything else? Uh, this is kind of an amateur version, just the guy making it look like he's on site. But uh, pe people in this room do stuff like that. So right, right, right there. So anyway, uh, we, we can take those out. Some of those are real. Some of those are fake. That, that were just, we just scrolled through them. You can kind of decipher. But the, the point is this. It's getting more difficult to discern what's real and what's fake, especially with media, especially with the images. And, and fake news is simply this. It's simply using misleading information to damage the reputation of a person or an event. Like, like even headlines. You can take headlines and headlines and images, they, they often grab you. Like, like you could read, I pulled some older headlines. Headlines like this, again, I'm just throwing out headlines that, that grab you. That could be real, could be fake. Trump assassination attempt, staged. Harris uses AI to make crowds bigger. Harris wears earpiece during debate. The horrors of Project 2025 revealed. Like those are attention-grabbing headlines. And here's the thing. News, social media, YouTube, AI, whatever you want to call out. Like the, the, all these things we are surrounded by. Fabricated and manipulated content. You can tell, it's pretty amazing, it's pretty uh, easy in some ways. You can tell and create whatever story you want with really just carefully crafted words, images, or videos. 
You can tell whatever story you want about whoever you want with just carefully crafted words, images, videos, you name it. Now, obviously, in biblical times, they didn't have all that technology. But what you're going to see here is Nehemiah gets caught in a smear campaign. He's the leader of this project of rebuilding the wall for Israel, trying to make Jerusalem the city that it once was, and trying to make it that the city of God, the light to the nations that it once was. He's the leader of that. But now he gets caught up in a smear campaign. And what you're going to see is this. Despite the misinformation and attempt to tarnish his reputation, Nehemiah perseveres, trusting in his faithful God. And that's kind of the simple takeaway I want you to get today. That we have a faithful God that is worthy of our trust in all situations and circumstances. So let's begin. Let's read verses 1 through 9 in chapter 6 as we jump in. It says, Now when Samballot and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall... And that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors and the gates. Sam Ballot and Geshem sent to me saying, Come, let us meet together at Hecophirium in the plain of Ono. But they intended to do me harm. And I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way, and I answered them in the same manner. In the same way, Sam Ballot, for the fifth time, sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. In it, it was written. Here's the headline. It is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That is why you are building the wall, and according to these reports... You wish to become their king. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah, and now the king will hear of these reports. So now come and let us take counsel together. Then I sent to him, saying, No such things as you say have been done, for you are inventing them out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will not be done. But now, O God, strengthen my hands. So so here's kind of the simple thing that's going on. And hopefully you caught some of that there as we were reading those verses. But but Nehemiah, like, like at this point I would think he'd be really tired and exhausted. He's taking on a huge mission. It's taking a lot of work. It's, it must have been physically and emotionally draining. He's been dealing with harassment. He's been dealing with mockery. He's been dealing with, with threats from the outside and from the inside. He's had to exhort and rebuke his own at times. And here, now as the wall nears completion, they just have some, some doors basically to put up at the gates, things like that. Now as the wall nears completion, his old pals, these enemies, kind of show up once again. And, and they really conspire together. They probably don't even like each other, but they all have a mission of stopping Nehemiah. And they don't want Jerusalem to have any kind of uh, say or anything or, or to become a city once again. So basically due to political ambitions, they're just joining together. And so they conspire together to develop this smear campaign against Nehemiah. So the first thing they say is this, it's, it's let's make it true. So they start off trying to be nice, kind of like, hey, wow, you really built the wall. It's actually standing. It, it, it didn't fall over. All the amateurs, it kind of played out. It, it works. So, hey, we get it. You're here. Let, let's just make it true. Like, like, let's be friends. Let, let's meet up at a, at a neutral territory and set our differences aside. And let's just talk together how we can coexist. Since you obviously went through is what you said you were going to do. And, and Nehemiah instantly discerns this is probably a setup. And most likely it was like an assassination attempt. And so he just rejects their multiple requests. 
So next, they kind of up it a little bit. Well, he's not coming to meet us, so now let's send an open letter. The key to that is this. It's an open letter. It's not secure. It's not sealed. Like like when you order DoorDash, your bag should have a sticker on it, like like sealed, to let you know no one messed with your food, no one hopefully spit in it, no one touched it, did anything to it while they were driving it to your house. All that stuff, right? It's supposed to be sealed. This letter, most letters would go out sealed so it was known that no one would read it. It would be private. Their intent was to make sure people read the letter. Again, obviously it's not like social media that can spread instantly, but they leave it open. The intent was to make it go public all the way up to the king so the king himself would read it. And and through this letter, they're just going to create a story that will grab headlines. They're just going to create a story. It would be like the, the, the headline in the letter or the headline would read something like, Reports say... Nehemiah's rebuild is an insurrection against the king. Local prophets agree. Like, like that would be the headline. It's kind of like, hey, you, you lead with January 6th insurrection, and, and you instantly got everyone's full attention. So they attack his character. They attack his motives. And what do we see Nehemiah do? He simply stands firm. He denies their false claims, and he prays for strength and perseverance perseverance. Over and over and over again, Nehemiah goes to prayer. It's pretty amazing because I don't know, when when someone's attacking or assassinating your character, I don't know if your your first thought is to go to prayer. Like I think if someone's assassinating your character, your first reaction is you want to fight back. Is someone saying something completely wrong about me that I know it's not true and they're spreading that rumor, I'm going to want to defend myself. Is someone's lying about you, especially to your friends or to your family or to to people around you, like if someone's lying about you, you're going to want to, to defend yourself. Like, people can spread horrible rumors and horrible lies that that just destroy lives and destroy reputations. It's hard to ignore liars. It's hard to ignore slanderers. It's hurtful. It's painful. You want to defend. But often, often it's best not to engage and to just speak truth, trusting that God will vindicate you. It is a hard place to be, and we see Nehemiah do it. It's kind of interesting when you talk about, like, smear campaigns. Like, it's not just political. It's not just now in our political uh, heightened and the fiery age that we live in. Like, smear campaigns, they can happen anywhere. They can happen in churches. They can happen in businesses. They can happen in schools. They can happen in families. They can happen in marriages. I mean, think about it. And maybe some of you, maybe you've, you've been a part of one, sadly. Uh, maybe you've been on the other side of it, receiving end of it. But if you don't like someone, if you don't like a decision or a direction that they made, or you're just jealous of them, all you need to do is create some kind of narrative to get them out of the way. Like, like if you don't like the pastor, or you don't like the pastors, you don't like Kyle, Dave, myself, or you don't like the elders, you don't like the, a, a decision that was made or the direction that things are going or something that's being done in, in the church, you know what? All you have to do is spin something. I, I'm giving you tips here. All you have to do is like, just all you have to do is spin something. All you have to do is circulate a post or circulate an email because it will circulate really quick. And you can create a narrative in whatever story you want. If you're jealous, if you don't like them, you don't like the direction, whatever it might be, and, and you, can, you can get them out of there. You don't like your boss? You, you can spin something. You're struggling with your spouse. You're going through a horrible divorce or something like that. You can spin something. You don't like your boss. You don't like your spouse. All you have to do is stir something inappropriate. Stir something inappropriate that took place in the office, or you're going to claim took place in the office. Stir something inappropriate that that your spouse supposedly did. And and, and you can just create whatever narrative, whatever story you want. Smear campaigns on all levels can happen everywhere. And sadly, we engage them to some degree often too much than we, we probably would want to admit. 
And, and let me just tell you this. If good is happening in the church, if good is happening in the church, expect Satan to unleash his whole arsenal to stop the spread of the gospel. If there's good happening in the church, and I believe there is much good happening in this place, and we already are experiencing oppositions to small degrees, but Satan will unleash his whole arsenal, all levels, every angle, to make sure you stop the mission of bringing the gospel to life in the church community of the world, to stop the Great Commission, to stop the spread of the gospel. That's why, like Nehemiah, we need to be people that we are praying constantly, that we are on guard and we are ready, ready to do what God is calling us to do, even in the face of opposition. Like, like they're so relentless, these enemies, after the first two tries don't work, uh, they bring in what we would say is a false prophet in verses 10 to 14. It says this. It says, now when I went into the house... Of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, son of Mehetabal, who was confined to his home, he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. But I say, Should such a man as I run away? And what man such as I could go into the temple and live? I will not go in. And I understood and saw that God had not sent him, but he had pronounced a prophecy against me because Tobiah, Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. For this purpose he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in this way and sin. And so they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. Remember Tobiah and Sambalat, O oh my God, according to these things that they did, and also the prophetess Nodiah, Nodiah, and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. So, so they're like, they're, they're pulling out every tactic to try to just discredit Nehemiah. And, and they're so relentless, they go as far as to hire a false prophet to basically scare Nehemiah. And, and this false prophet, he so-called prophesies that, Nehemiah, someone is, is trying to kill you. Someone's going to come in the night, and, and they're going to take you out. So, Nehemiah, you need to hide in the temple with me so you're safe. And, and Nehemiah refuses. Why? Because he knows the Scriptures. Think of how simple this is. He knows the scriptures. He knew he could not enter the temple. He was not allowed to enter the temple. Plus, he refused to abandon his people. They wanted him to break the law. They wanted him to act afraid so his reputation would be discredited. And yet, what does he do? He stays on the front lines because he feared God more than man. He refused to go against God's word. He refused to, uh, to retreat. And he prayed for God's justice to prevail. He tested the so-called prophet. He wasn't a prophet. He tested the man's words. We say it up here all the time. And I hope you hear it. I know some of you do because you, you've said it to me. But, but you need, you need to test what you hear against Scripture. I'm, I'm going to say, we'll say it a thousand times. Test it. Don't just believe it because it's said on this stage. I appreciate it that you guys trust us. You trust us to, to bring you the word of God each and every Sunday. We are human. We can make mistakes. We're, we're, I'm going to strive for biblical accuracy as much as I can and, and take this responsibility. I will not take it lightly, but we are human. You need to test everything that is said. Test what you hear on the stage. Test it against Scripture. Don't blindly follow someone because they're popular or they're passionate or they're charismatic or they have a large church or they're on the TV. Don't blindly follow. Be discerning, wise, seek truth. Don't be manipulated into falsehood. Just because a pastor is on TV, test what he says. There's a lot of false doctrine and false things being taught out there. Make sure you are testing. It is so vital to know the word of God so you know when someone is manipulating, twisting something just enough that it's going to lead you astray. I can take a real picture and I can take a fake picture and I can put them together and, and you're going to believe whatever story I tell you. 
people can take a little bit of truth from Scripture and add something in false and present it in a way that you're just going to run with it. Make sure you know the Word of God. Despite the misinformation, despite the attempt to tarnish his reputation, Nehemiah perseveres, trusting in his faithful God. Look at verses 15 to 19. It says, The wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elul. In 52 days, and when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem. For they perceived that the work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him. But because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Era, and the son of Jehoanan, had taken the daughter of, of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, his wife, Also they spoke of his good deeds in my presence and reported my words to him. And Tobiah sent letters to make me afraid. So here is the amazing, the wall is completed, right? A couple little touch-up things, the wall is done. And the surrounding nations were amazed, amazed at standing, amazed in in just a record-breaking time they built the wall. They knew, even these unbelieving nations knew this had to be a work of their God. There's no other explanation why this wall would go up. And yet still, even after everything that's accomplished, even with them being amazed, there's still letters circulating about Nehemiah. And this one's a little more challenging because here you have Tobiah circulating letters. And he had an in. You can look up the history. He had an in. He was in with the family. So he was actually in with some of the Jews. He had an in. He was well known. Some of the businessmen probably did business with him. So they're struggling now because they make money through working with Tobiah. They don't want to see Tobiah discredited because that's how they make their money. So it's kind of hard when when they they see Nehemiah saying things and now Tobiah saying things about Nehemiah. They don't want to lose their their funding, all that stuff. So Tobiah's just sowing seeds of mistrust among the people. And all this turmoil is happening within. And again, all you see is Nehemiah be steadfast. He doesn't get distracted. He sticks to his mission, trusting that God would bring justice. He desires above all to see God glorified once again in the land. Did you notice he's not worried about protecting his own reputation. He's still worried about protecting the reputation of God. That's where his heart is. That's where he's focused. He's not getting tangled up in all this mess and all this discrediting and all this character assassination. He's focused on making God's name known again. Because his heart breaks when God's reputation is being defamed. He wanted his people to thrive as a nation for the glory of God. The wall is like phase one. Even though this this book talks a lot about the wall, the wall is phase one. It's not the end goal. It's kind of like, it's it's like phase one of the project. It's like the the playground, like the playground put out by it. That's phase one. The whole outdoor area, those are other phases. Even that, I would tell you, that's not the end goal to what we dream about for for this campus. The the wall was a key component, but it wasn't the end goal. God's glory and the people and their spiritual health within the wall, that's what was vital. The, The church building doesn't define you. This building doesn't define us. This is a key gathering place. We, I believe in the western U.S. where we live, we need this structure. It marks us as a place of worship to the community. It sets us apart, allows us to come together, all those things. But listen, it's just a building. The people, God's glory, his gospel message is more important than anything else. Spiritual health, salvations, discipleship, hearing the good news of Jesus Christ, those are all the essential elements. Don't attend here because you think it's a nice building. Attend because Jesus is preached, Jesus is loved, and Jesus is shared. Attend because you desire to soak in the gospel truth that fallen humanity has a redeemer. 
That God, by his grace alone, gave us Jesus to redeem us from our sins. 1 John 4.10 says, This is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. 1 Timothy 1.15 says, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. All who believe, all who believe in Jesus Christ will be saved. Romans 10 tells us, if you, 9, 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. You know what that means, church? When one confesses their sin, repents of their sins, and comes to a saving faith in Jesus Christ, all due to the grace of God, that means we are no longer enemies. We are no longer on the outside of the wall looking in. We are now part of God's community. We are now adopted sons and daughters, welcomed into his kingdom. Galatians chapter 4 tells us, verse 4, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Nehemiah. Despite all the fake news, despite the smear campaign, he set his sights. This is what he begins to do. And this is where you see the turn taken in the book. He sets his sight now on developing the spiritual community. This is, the, the wall is built, church. The, the wall is built. They, they, they have their structure. It's like the, the trellis. They have the trellis. They have the structure in place. Now it's time to work on the vine. Now it's time to work on the hearts of the people. So what we see in chapter 7, and we're just going to read the first six verses, is in chapter 7 you see him delegating out responsibilities. He says this, chapter 7. When the wall had been built and I had set up the doors and the gatekeepers and the singers and the Levites had been appointed, I gave my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the governor of the castle, charge over Jerusalem. For he was more faithful and God-fearing man than many. And I said to them, let not the gates of Jerusalem be open until the sun is hot. And while they are still standing guard, let them shut and bar the doors. Appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Some at their guard post and some in front of their own homes. The city was wide and large, but the people within it were few and no houses had been rebuilt. Then my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles and the officials and the people to be enrolled by genealogy. And I found the book of the genealogy of those who came up at first, and I found written in it. These were the people of the province who came up out of the captivity of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried into exile. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his, own, each to his town. They came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Azariah, Ramiah, Nehemiah, blah, 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 Mordecai, Bilshan, Mesbereth, Bigvi, sounds like a, oh, never mind, uh, Nahum, and, and Banna. So, and then it goes on, and basically what you get is a whole genealogy after that from the rest of the chapter of all the history of the returned exiles. But what Nehemiah does, he's, he's focusing now, he, he's shifting into focus on the spiritual community. So he's handing out, delegating responsibility. He's choosing leaders with character and integrity who fear God. He's beginning to establish, reestablish community life. Many of the people still lived outside of the walls. So, so now he begins the work of repopulating the city. This is kind of like, you remember how we talked about, I think it's like chapter 2, like this was like a, a revitalization project. This was like the downtown Phoenixville, downtown Boyertown. This is like, hey, we're at the point, downtown Boyertown. The streets are finally open. You can get through for the most part. There's, there's one or two more still blocked, but you can get through. 
Like, like the project worked for the most part. You can now go and, and visit the, the newer shops, the newer places to eat, all that stuff. It's like the revitalization project is working. So now it's time to repopulate, to re-engage. So what you see is the rest of chapter 7 is a repeated list from Ezra 2 of the returned exiles. And through it, he simply affirms who is part of the covenant community, making sure they wouldn't forget their history. It's kind of like, here are the people that have gone before you. Here is how you got here. Don't forget those who established all this. For us, it would be like, hey, we need to know our history. Don't cancel it. We need to know it. You need to know the, how this country was established. You need to know how people fought wars, died, so you have the freedoms that you have here. Also, don't forget her church history. Learn it. Much perseverance, much sacrifice, much bloodshed has taken place for God's truth. Don't forget the past. Don't forget why you're here and have what you have and live generous lives now for the gospel. So in closing, despite the misinformation and the attempt to tarnish his reputation, Nehemiah persevered, trusting in the faithfulness of God. Church, opposition will come. We say it a lot. It's going to come on all kinds of levels to all degrees. Character assassinations, fake news, seeds of distrust, seeds of disunity. I don't know. The list goes on and on. Name it. Satan will unleash all kinds of threats to break apart any good that is happening in his church. So like we said in week one of this series, church, you need to pray. Pray hard. Pray daily for your leadership, for everyone in this room, for the people sitting next to you. Be in prayer consistently, constantly. Be discerning. Stand firm. Persevere fearing God and trusting that he is faithful always and no one, no one can thwart his plans and his will for his church and his kingdom. Let's close in a, wor a word of prayer uh, this morning. Father God, we do just pray that we would be a church, a praying church, a church committed to, to praying for one another often, Lord. That we would be a church that we are discerning so we are not taken away by, by fake news or false gospels or false teachers or whatever might come our way. But also, God, that we would be discerning to, to know what is true. Know what is true in your word. Know what is true about one another. And, God, let us be a place that we stand firm. We stand firm in our mission. We stand firm in, in living out that great commission. We stand firm in proclaiming the gospel truths and that we would persevere. Not fearing man, but fearing you with a reverence and awe of who you are and trusting that you are a faithful God who is with us always. You've shown it in the past, you show it today, and you will show it in the future. Help us to trust that in every circumstance. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.